All right, thank you all for joining us. I want to thank Josh for inviting me and congratulations on uh, Sesky Centennial, right? 50 years to the trust, so that's a big day. Um, so what I'd like to do is have a sort of review of animals, as you say, other than, other than human beings. So all the other parts of the animal kingdom affecting landscape, and I'm gonna talk about very large animals, either large invertebrates or large vertebrates, some more common than others, but nevertheless, hopefully by the end of the talk, we'll get an appreciation uh, of how much effect the animal having now and have had in the past. Okay, so obviously, we we'll start with sort of what's called a keystone species, more on an ecological side of things, and also landscape engineer, uh, also more of an ecological term. So here it's like keystone landscape engineer, and it brings us maybe right to Pennsylvania, right, if you think of it as a keystone state. But anyway, definitely re returning beaver populations. Uh, there's a lot of ecology still to be done, but we've seen news article, obviously, uh, if you're w watching what's happening at Pennypack Trust, and I'll show you around uh, Cobbs Creek and Chamonix Creek, definitely returning population. And you'll see it may take a few beaver families to do quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of work. I don't necessarily call it damage. I mean, that's what beavers do. They cut trees. So it really depends whether you consider them nuisance species. Maybe they're constructive uh, for some ecological niches. Maybe they'll be destructive uh, on the other side of the spectrum, I just came back from the Lithuania, and there are huge controversies between the salmon fraction and the beaver fraction, and how salmon ponds are being uh, completely uh, isolated by beavers, and actually there's a huge negative impact on that fish population. But anyway, from a geological perspective, obviously except fossilized wood, you may not see that much of an evidence of beaver dams, you may see evidence of ancient lakes. There are very few sort of fossilized or relic dams, but nevertheless, you can go through the woods today and see some relic or historic uh, beaver cut trees. It's very easy to identify. Uh, what's a little tougher to identify is the bank burrows. You see them here on the bottom, very, very large bank burrows. And one of the aspects of geological studies is not just looking at beaver dams as uh, sort of making a landscape mosaic, right, from a large river making many lakes and completely reshaping the landscape until they're hunted to near extinction in historic times. But also look at the features uh, such as burrows or beaver dams or beaver huts as indicators of long-term water level, right? Where's the long-term creek level? So it's sort of the study of historic or paleohydrology, study of old water tables and water levels, right? If you start finding uh, these beaver cut trees that are hundreds of meters away from modern creek, maybe there was a depression near those trees that used to be more permanently flooded, or maybe the floodplain extends to that area because beavers are not going to drag trees for hundreds of meters most of the time. So it actually gives you information on a vertical dimension as well. How can we use this relic or prehistoric beaver uh, features, things they built, either built construction or remove sediment when they build burrows, so sort of erosion, right? Erosion and construction, both, just like people do. We remove sediment in one place, we deposit it in another place. So how can we use all those features as indicators of water level? Now the beaver huts and beaver dams are less well preserved. Burrows may be better preserved if you can identify it as such, but as far as water level indicator, it's not as accurate, right? Because water level can be anywhere between the top of the bur burrow and the bottom of the burrow. So you have to put them together and see if you can reconstruct water level based on all the features. So again, think of it in terms of geological or earth science perspective as well. It's more than just ecology. All right, in general, I mean, you can think of a single footprint. There's a bison print. And then you can think of trampling, right? So today there are a few thousand bison in Colorado, but there are 35 million just when colonists arrived. So they created quite a bit of impact on the landscape. So one, from one foot trip, footprint, you can expand to trampling, just like many people walking on the beach. From one burrow, you can extend to massive biodurbation. These are giant burrows of land crabs in the Bahamas. These burrows are as large as our groundhog burrows, but they're 20,000 per hectare, just enormously dense 
burrowed ground. Then you see whales and dolphins feeding on the bottom, and you see these enormous depressions at low tide. So you go scientifically from studying individual traces, the science of ecology, to the science of many traces and the massive impact on the landscape. That's more of a study of zoogeomorphology, so impact of animal and landscape. And again, commonly we talk about animals other than human beings, obviously, or parts of the animal kingdom. Uh, again, example of bison trails. Uh, some of the ancient tributaries in the West were thought to be produced by bison trails, and then the water during flooding just follows the trails of bison. As they traverse rivers, they create the low points. Just like today, hippopotamus, right? Which in Greek means river horse. So hippopotamus walks here through the Akawanga Delta in uh, Botswana in Africa, and the flooding then takes the route of these trails they make. A little more subtle, but nevertheless. Okay, so, so this is sort of a very large scale trend. And some of these you can see from space with elephants and wombats in Australia. You can see a lot of these from space. You can get to Google Earth and do some really nice studies. And probably next semester, my geomorphology class that studies landforms due to animal activity will probably do a lot of these exercises using Google Earth. Okay, even in the past, there have been evidence for dinosaur called avulsions. So that's when the river takes a new course during flood. And also when the river floods and it comes out of its main channel, it's gonna exploit any low area uh, next to the channel. So obviously there'll be breaks or gaps in the river channel where dinosaurs walk through. Just like today, again, bison or hippos or wildebeest cross the channel, they produce breaks in levees and they produce lower areas. So the, when the river is flooded back in the Jurassic or Cretaceous, they took these roots which were the uh, dinosaur trails. There's actually evidence of those. Okay, so these are dinosaur caused avulsions. And these are very difficult to recognize today because again, something that was produced by animal trampling today has river flowing through it. So you have to look at the patterns and maybe see some evidence of uh, parts of these channels maybe that were not scoured by river action. So it's a challenging test, but nevertheless, theoretically, it's definitely possible. And again, human activity, any access points to rivers or making pathways through coastal dunes, that's what the storms and floods uh, go through first, right? Well, we make holes through ridges. So it sort of makes sense. Water takes the lowest points and follows the, the new channel on a floodplain. So this has been happening for hundreds of millions of years. So there's some entire landscapes that are occupied by dinosaur trampling and even dinosaur nesting grounds. So both in the past and today, when I talk about effects of this animal activity, especially biturbation on slopes, think of this nice Bahamian right, site. You know, today it's an infinity pool, beautiful view. You're up on the cliff. So coastal erosion, maybe it's not that much of an issue because the ocean is way far down. There's a nice beach. So definitely a great place to build, and that's what they did. But maybe there's a, there's a place nearby where you may want to build a house or something like this on the cliff. So let's take the seagull eye view. So we're going to have a seagull looking right at the top of this cliff. Okay, Not this exact one, but similar one in the Bahamas. So this is uh, the island of San Salvador where Columbus first landed. So if, if we're the looking from the ocean, so the seagull view of the cliff, right? And it's good the seagulls because they flew over the sea because of the flow of the bays that they called bagels. So the seagull view into the cliff, you can see it's perforated with these relatively large burrows. Again, five to 10 centimeters in diameter. So imagine if this is a site nearby, maybe you have to think twice before building a nice uh, home here or a pool because your entire ground is 10, 20 percent voids, right? Some of these burrows may be filled, you won't even see them, but today, as you can see on the bottom, again, looking onto the cliff on a nearby island, you can see quite a bit of bioturbation. In this case, it's by those land crab, blackback land crab in the Bahamas, okay? So again, probably before building all this, these folks had to do some assessment and make sure there's you know, no holes in the ground. Otherwise, when it rains and when the water leaks from the pool, you're gonna create a lot of piping and a lot of slope instability, okay? 
So again, these crabs don't climb up the cliff and burrow into the ground like swallows or some nesting birds. They simply burrow into this sediment from above. And then as the cliff retreats by coastal erosion, you start exposing these burrows. Just like today, you can go along Delaware River and you can see large groundhog burrows sticking out of the cliff because they're intersected by bluff retreat or by river erosion, okay? So these are just some of the sort of big picture uh, ways of looking at bioturbation. If, if this crab burrows on the beach, you can imagine when there's an oil spill, the oil is gonna preferentially go into these burrows and sit there for decades. It's happened in the Persian Gulf during the first Gulf War, as it happened in the Gulf oil spill. So there are all these ramifications to understanding uh, places that have been bioturbated today. And if you think of ancient systems that are bioturbated, then you have scientists earning six-figure salaries because all of the important petroleum reservoirs have burrows in them. So understanding how oil and gas, and in this case, groundwater or an oil spill, moves through sediment and through burrows will you know, give you a nice prediction of how fast it's gonna come out, how to clean it up, how to extract it. So these are not trivial questions, they're important on both sides of the spectrum. Again, whether you're looking for hydrocarbons or trying to clean them up. So some of the sites I've been working uh, in yellow, these are specifically related to animal impact on landscape. And I'll talk about close to home, sort of Pennsylvania, and then we'll travel to a few other locations, again, Bahamas and a few other places in the world. I'll show you examples of animal impact on landscape. If you have any questions along the way, just press the space bar and you can unmute yourself temporarily. Uh, otherwise, you can put them in the chat and I can see it at the, at the end, I can answer those. But feel free to interrupt me, especially if there's some unusual scientific jargon that I left in some of the slides. So take home again is, uh, I think animal impact on landscape has been underappreciated and with humans moving much more sediment than glaciers did in the last ice age, it's obviously been overprinted by human activity, but nevertheless, you can still see a lot of animal activity that just been shifted to other, other sites. And as I'll show you, a lot of animals are returning. Some of them that have been cut down to nearly extinction, like beavers, like sea turtles, like seals, uh, sea lions that are coming back. So our view of the activity uh, is really limited because we only know what's been happening in the last few decades based on our observation. Well, we have to go back hundreds of years pre-extinction or pre-near extirpation so we can appreciate the impact on landscape. So again, we'll start in Pennsylvania, sort of temperate region. We'll look at some beaver activity, fish in the creeks, just like you look at Pennypack Creek, there's some invasive or introduced carp species. All right, so again, the beaver is terrorizing I guess some local uh, uh, residents and uh, obviously cutting down trees at a very, very fast rate. Pennypack, this is in the Chamonix Creek. So we'll look, at, we'll look at this resurgent activity. I've been looking at it just for the last couple of years. And again, being there with a, a Pennypack Trust, working with Josh and others, it's been really neat to see some of the effect of even one beaver family. All right, so this is our study with a student along. Uh, the Chamonix Creek, so uh, you know, around central Bucks County. So all of the green were very recent activity and I've seen more just in the past month and you can see it better fall or early spring before the vegetation comes in. There's a lot of new activity. You can still see the shavings uh, next to the stumps of really large trees taken down. So we have some, uh, some sort of historic activity, somewhat old and uh, waterlogged beaver cut stumps and some brand new stumps, which we're mapping in detail. A lot of them actually on the left or east side of the creek for some reason. I've looked on both sides. I know I, they're most preferentially on the left side of the creek. Okay, and this is again a lot of information. I'm just showing you an example of a student poster that never got to be presented at the regional conference in Reston, Virginia. The, the conference was canceled three days before it happened, but all the students put together posters. This is my geomorphology class that all the students have a first and co-authored uh, conference abstract. And this is an example of them studying beaver cut trees, which way the trees all fall and which side of the cuts are, how far they are from the river and so on. So just example of a scientific poster uh, at a conference 
uh, produced mostly by undergraduate students. And that's our study on the shaman. All right, so even closer to you. So this is Pennypack Trust. So these are maybe some of you have uh, added a lot of these GPS locations here. So this is all from Perth, right? So thanks again to Josh keeping this website. And that's how actually we got connected about a year ago. And again, some students use this information to look at distance from the creek. Uh, when we were out there with Josh, uh, maybe in uh, January or a little earlier, we actually see some of the juvenile gnawings on the adventitious roots, so right near the creek. So very, very small tooth marks right near the creek. They're actually chewing on these, on these roots, which is interesting, probably just practicing cutting tree, which is unusual because I wasn't thinking of them going after the roots. So again, think of it implications for bank stability. And hopefully we'll do more research there, especially with the videos that you keep. It'd be a really nice study. And there's more of this going on at the Heinz Park, Heinz National, I guess it's, it, there's a park near the airport, right? John Heinz um, Park. So it's going on in a lot of places and park rangers are interested in bringing any colleges and geologists to look at impacts of beavers. And even looking into the river, you can sometimes see both turtles, and in this case, fish that was introduced 150 years ago to control vegetation. So these carp from Asia are, and now snakeheads coming in, they're digging little burrows, and there are a lot of feeding pits. I've seen them feeding, so, so there's quite a bit of carp sucker, and catfish produce a lot of these. But in the Nishamini and Pennebec, a lot of it is mostly carp. Very large carp, staying in the same spot their entire lives, through all the floods and just chewing at the, at the bottom, producing these pits. So resuspending sediment, nutrients, creating a lot of, a lot of redeposition of sediment. Okay, so again, they're non-native. There's no more plants left. They're, they have no natural predators. Even fishermen throw them back in the water, right, unless you use other techniques. So they just get to live 15 years. They get up to, even in, in the Chamonix, they get up to 19, 20 pounds. They're much bigger in Delaware and they do a lot of sediment reworking. Okay, so you can do some calculations based on pit diameters, and just to summarize, they get up to, uh, just based on image analysis, up to 50 cubic centimeters uh, per uh, square meter, or you know, up to 1,000 cubic centimeters per square meter. That's a lot of sediment being reworked and taken downstream. So I think it's an important process that's underappreciated. A lot of this record gets erased during floods, but nevertheless, there is this activity and resuspension of sediment by fish between the floods, which is completely ignored usually by uh, fluvial or river geomorphologists. And when the water level is low, you can see some of the feeding structures from carp, not just erosion by water, but actually feeding structures from carp that is now above water level. So obviously if you walk there today, there's no water, so you think that it has something to do maybe with uh, some semi-aquatic animals, although there really are none that will be just chewing at the river banks. But once you realize that the water was higher up and the carp was just feeding at the banks, that'll give you a good idea of uh, previous water table elevation. So again, you have to, you know, you can use them as water table indicators, right? So if you can identify a groundhog burrow, the water table has to be below. Fish burrow, or feeding structure from carp or a catfish burrow, the water table has to be above. So if you have burrows of groundhog and catfish of the same age, then you know that the water table, long-term water table was somewhere in between, okay? Interestingly, the best indicators of water table are these very, very small, gently inclined burrows, right? Maybe it's similar to what mink has or some other animal, although they're not numerous, but in Russia there is this, interesting animal called the Russian Desmond. It's like a water mole and its burrows are very, very small and gently inclined. So the vertical dimension is half a meter, so less than two feet. But just like beaver burrows, the bottom has to be below river water and the top has to be above. So if you ever find a Desmond burrow, whether it's above water table today or submerged, then you know that the long-term water table was right there in the middle, so you can constrain it quite nicely. Again, with beaver burrows, they can be, they can span two to three or four meters in a vertical dimension. 
So you can't really constrain the water table as accurately, but these are examples of some animals that are, you know, have burrows as water, really good indicators. It just the challenge is recognizing it as such. Okay, and then again, a lot of information just to show you that you can take some animals that always prefer to be above water table, some that tend to be below water table, and then you can come up with really good indicators that are, that are very close to that water table. Okay, so these are some of the studies we've been doing. There's still a lot to be done. All right, now doing similar studies, but moving over to the tropics. So some of the research we've done in the Bahamas, my two previous graduate students, we've been doing work uh, looking at these crab burrows in the Bahamas. I think I explained why it's important for sort of a geotechnical reasons, but also for understanding importance of crabs in creating new soils. They're called white soils in the Bahamas. People couldn't figure out how they form. It's probably just crab bioturbation. Also, Every time you see a crab burrow, usually as a geologist, you tend to interpret it as a marine environment, right? So ancient marine carbonates. Well, in this case, all these crabs are burrowing in dunes. So all of these carbonates are above sea level. They're not marine, the aeolian. So just simple observations like that. So you need to know what these burrows look like so you don't confuse them with marine crab burrows, right? So here we're studying crabs at the Tropic of Cancer, which is sort of kind of nice. So Tropic of Cancer right, runs right through this site. Some of these crabs get a little closer to water table. So there's this giant blue crab, which is globally distributed, which is nice. And it likes to keep hydrated. So it's very close to the water table, which is great. So it lives in places where the tidal range is very, very small, right? Uh, archaeologists actually use these crab burrows to look for ancient artifacts. There's another interesting application of studying burrows because when archeologists look for a pre-Columbian natives in the Bahamas, most of them were buried under modern cemeteries. Well, let me put it this way. Modern Bahamian cemeteries are usually on top of ancient pre-Columbian cemeteries because by tradition, they bury their dead with a view of the ocean. So if you wanna study archeology span in the Bahamas and look at burial sites of Lucayans that, that were there before Columbus, you have to dig through modern cemeteries, which is obviously challenging or prohibitive. But you can walk around the crab burrows and they bring out, as they dig, they bring out these pottery, these artifacts. So they actually use crab burrowing to their advantage. Most of the time, it's a nuisance, right? For archeologists, any burrowing animal mixes things up and it just makes a mess. But as I showed you, geologically, archeologically speaking, you can use a lot of this biturbation to your advantage. So in this case, they're bringing to the surface artifacts that are depth in places where there's uh, you know, really no digging allowed, all right? And then we can take our remote sensing equipment like ground penetrating radar, we can X-ray the ground without disturbing the cemetery and see if we can find burial sites, right? In this case, again, we brought our own machine, we x-rayed. I know maybe you're looking just like a bunch of red and blue squiggles, but you can definitely see some uh, disturbance in a few places, right? The layers are nice and smooth and all of a sudden everything is chaotic. So these are actually blue crab burrows and you can see how far they extend and you can even see where the salt water begins because the signal disappears. So we use these non-invasive techniques like this geo-radar images or x-raying the ground to non-invasively look at some of the burrows at archeological sites and geological features, anything you like. This is an example of slicing through depth and looking at burrows similar to crabs. In this case, these are pine snakes in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. So they're trying to get them into endangered, uh, sort of into endangered species because uh, they wanna protect them in the Pine Barrens and they nest and some of the military bases, they nest next to the spent ammunition. So we've done some imaging of snake burrows. So what you're looking at is slices through depth. So this is, this is the bird's eye view of uh, the ground. So the hot colors are snake burrows, the red colors are the anomaly. And then you're just simply going down into the ground. So this is 
uh, maybe two or three inches down, then down, down, and eventually you go all the way down through the sequence. And when you end up down about 80 centimeters, so almost three feet, you can see maybe there's some deep root or part of the burrow, but most of what you see is just the background sand, glacial sand, right? So a lot of animal activity at the surface and then much less in the subsurface, but you can reconstruct in three dimensions this network without disturbing the snakes. So this is really powerful, non-invasive tool, and you do it at the speed of light. Very, very fast uh, image, you know. I'll have a graduate student coming in, please join us today, Aiden, who'll be using this technique both through space and through time to look at, uh, to look at these ch first changes through time in animal burrowing, but also at some of the, some of the existing burrows, and maybe we'll see some new burrows intersecting burrows that are already filled because again a lot of these you can see with your naked eyes there may be other burrows next door so to speak which you cannot see maybe backfill right so this is an example of a diamondback terrapin right the only north american estuarine turtle so we did this imaging right after it oviduposited deposited eggs in this protected site in new jersey so you can see here's the burrow or the nest actually so there is a nest just laid the eggs but look all around See these hot zones right here? These are all recent nests. To, when we were doing it, all these nests were filled. So if you look at top left right here, you cannot see any more nests. I mean, I suppose the, the scientists have recorded where they were, but to, as, as you're looking at this picture, as we're watching this particular turtle and then subsequently image the site, there is no surface evidence of any more nests right here. And yet, using the radar image, and very quickly, we can see that there are many more other depressions, this, these anomalies that are likely other nests. And this, this is all on a protected island inside the inlet, because otherwise the raccoons, the foxes, the ravens get after the, get after the eggs. Okay, so this is a really neat example of our study. Again, this is this island, um, Sedge Island in New Jersey. This is... A good example of our study immediately following deposition of eggs. And then you can do it afterwards, so you can do it through time. So a lot of implications for conservation ecology. Now, expanding, so getting closer to the sea. I mean, we have estuarine turtle. Now we can talk about sea turtles. And I already gave you an example of fish and uh, freshwater turtle also digging into digging into bluffs, creeks, through some legacy sediment and collapsing the banks of these small creeks. So for small creeks, this is a lot of activity. Just like for small beaches, these turtles, sea turtles, um, rework quite a bit of sediment, okay? But we'll start in the deeper sea first. So we did some work in Mediterranean. We actually worked offshore Israel, so we saw most of the activity by sea skates and crabs. But in other parts, there's a lot of evidence of uh, whales that are feeding on the squid and other bottom animals. And you can see these gouges that last for decades, these enormous gouges in the seafloor produced by whales. Cuvier's beak whales can dive 1,000 meters, maybe more. So a lot of them are in the deep sea here in Mediterranean. This is one of the most imp biologically impoverished sites in the world ocean, or at least biologically diverse or fewest species here in the eastern Mediterranean is anywhere in the world for that depth of the ocean. And yet, there's quite a bit of activity by whales and squid and crabs and shrimp and deep water sharks and so on. Okay, there were studies done in the Bering Sea, both walrus in the shallow water and gray whales in the deep water in the Bering Sea, south of Alaska, do quite a bit of sediment reworking. If, Calculated to the back of the envelope, just the gray whales in the Bering Sea rework 120 million cubic meters of sediment per year, which is three times the annual discharge of the Yukon River. So they resuspend and redeposit three times more sediment that comes out of Yukon River per year. Okay, again, based on the volumes of sediment. So this is an underwater uh, sort of side scan image of these depressions produced by gray whales. And when the tide falls, you can see similar depressions at low tide in the state of Washington, Alaska, right? So you can go at low tide, see these enormous depressions. Uh, you can see them uh, due to uh, skates or rays in Florida, even probably in Maryland and New Jersey. 
at least in areas where there are large tidal ranges, southern New Jersey. Some of them have been confused in ancient sediments. They were confused for dinosaur footprints, right? I mean, the smaller seascape feeding depressions were confused for dinosaur footprints. But here, uh, these are examples of gray whale feeding pits in the intertidal area. So again, these are exposed when the tide goes down. So a lot of sediment rework. Now sea turtles, I mean, they're endangered today. Obviously there are a few beaches. We don't know how many more islands, at least in the Bahamas or places in Florida to North Carolina have been visited by sea turtles up to Delaware. But nevertheless, they have enormous impact because they always come back to the same beach where they were born, right? So if you understand just the basics of sea turtle nests and the tracks going in and out and, and then the juveniles come back out. So, so the basic science of sea turtle nests and tracks, you can come up with some volumes that they involve. And here, here's an x-ray or georadar image of a sea turtle nest. I know it's a nest because overnight there are tracks going in and out and then we're asked, this is in Florida, one of the state parks in Florida were asked to find the nest so the volunteers can protect it from raccoons, who evidently are unaware that sea turtles are endangered. So it took us a few traverses, but we were able to actually go right next to the, to, the, to the area where sea turtle turned around in the cover pit, and we were able to locate this V-shaped depression. And lo and behold, when they dug down, they found the freshly deposited eggs. So it would have taken volunteers probably hours and maybe even damaged them if they wanted just to look for the eggs, you know, sort of going at it blind. So within 10 minutes, we're able to locate it and the volunteers were able to put a, a metal uh, netting to protect it from predators. Now, the reason it's difficult to find because both the nest and the body pit sort of in the shape of a sea turtle, again, all of it is happening at full moon at night, then is completely reworked by this cover pit. So the sea turtle to confuse the predators reworks a very large area, sometimes three, four meters, more than 10 feet in diameter. So a lot of times the nesting pit, the egg chamber and the body pit are completely masked. You just have an enormous area of disturbed sand. Some of it extends all the way into dunes, which makes you think that massive sea turtle nesting, especially higher up in the dunes, probably produce these low, low areas that may maybe make beaches vulnerable to storms, right? Sea turtle nests made beaches vulnerable to storms. Again, not in our present view when they're endangered and few and far between, but in ancient times, they're much more numerous, right? So for Lucayans and Taino, so the folks that are living in the Caribbean and Cuba before Columbus arrived, they are both used for food, so easy meals, eggs and turtles themselves, you can see they're absolutely uh, in widespread and, and numerous. And also they're sacred for ancient Lucans because the trek where the mother sea turtle reminded them of the Milky Way. So they're both revered and used for food. In fact, flipped on its shell and cooked on an open fire, the fried turtle, sea turtle meat and fish meat in Lucayan is called barbacoa, which is what our barbecue comes from, okay? And Columbus, when he arrived in San Salvador, this island here, the first landing spot, he said that there were so many sea turtles, he could walk from island to island on the backs of sea turtles. Based on consumptions of seaweed, some biologists estimated that 10 to 100 million Sea turtles, just green sea turtles, were present in the Caribbean when, when Columbus arrived. So just 500 years ago, tens of millions of sea turtles. Again, they only returned to the islands where they were born. So we only know of a few places today. These are modern sea turtle nesting sites, but it's sort of catch-22. Where are the ancient sites? So to find the ancient sites that are not eroded, you have to go to places like this, which had a lot of sediment accumulated, beach ridges one after another, you can go to ancient beaches and you can look through these beaches and maybe find sea turtle nests, right? So you have to go to places where there's been a lot of accretion of new beach sediment and go back away from the beach and that's where the ancient beach sequences 
may preserve evidence of sea turtle nests. I won't be surprised if they're completely dug up by sea turtles. Again, the challenge is that some of the beaches which used to be sea turtle nesting grounds today have no sea turtles, right? So you have to sort of go blind and look at all those ancient beaches. Maybe you'll confuse some of them with uh, graves of the natives, right? So for archeologists, it's very important to be able to distinguish a shallow grave from a shallow sea turtle nest. Their dimensions are almost identical. For me as a geologist, it's extremely important to differentiate a shallow depression that is produced by a sea turtle or depression produced by a storm surge. Because if I'm going to this ancient beach and I'm doing this beautiful x-ray view, as you can see here, the ocean is on the right, the beach is on the left, right? And there are like 30 of these ridges in some of the places in the Bahamas. So this is an ancient beach, an ancient dune, and a newer beach, and a newer dune, and one after another. Just 30 individual beaches formed over the past 2,000 years. All of these ridges due to storms. So if I go to this ancient beach and I excavate it, or because it's sort of turned into a rock now, I image it with the radar and I find a lot of depressions, I may misinterpret sea turtle nests for storm channels. And now I'm waving my arms talking about storminess and climate change and sea level and, and tsunamis. And instead, I may be simply looking at sea turtle nests. So my depression in the ancient beach is not a storm or a tsunami channel, it's a sea turtle nest. But you would say there are no sea turtles there today, but there were in the past. So this is very important research that still needs to be done. It's completely uh, understudied or unstudied, I would say, looking for ancient sea turtle nests. So far, there's only been one identified, I think, 100 million year old sea turtle nest in Colorado somewhere, but they're completely uh, underappreciated. There are ancient sea turtles that are three, four meters in size that produce enormous nests. Okay, and then just having fun, other animals burrow, right? Darwin described penguins that burrowed. Uh, in fact, in Camden Aquarium, they're in Philadelphia. Um, you can see the African penguins have little PVC pipes. That's sort of to mimic their nests. <laughs> Not just in Antarctica, in Africa and other places. So you have these burrowing penguins. There are some islands in the Southern Ocean where like 90% of the turf land of the island is biterbated by penguins. Okay, so kind of important for hydrology, the vegetation, and so on. Also, pinnipeds do a lot of digging, right? They don't produce burrows, but do a lot of haul outs and sun uh, sand bathing so they dig up a lot of sediment pinnipeds so walrus sea lion seals okay so i think you would agree that these sea lions will leave quite a bit of uh evidence on this beach now whether it gets preserved in a long term that's a different story but if, again if i'm a coastal geologist and i am and i'm going to a beach like this where today maybe there are few pinnipeds or none because they're all hunted to extinction, right? And I start seeing these chaotic uh, images in my x-rays. Maybe I shouldn't interpret them as storms or wind. Maybe these were trampling by walrus, right? What if we go to Alaska and, and some historic beach ridges? Shows us there's been a lot of uh, haul outs by walrus. How is that important? Well, maybe it'll tell us that the sea ice wasn't as extensive 600 years ago, similar to what we're predicting for the future, right? Because what we're saying is all the walrus is on the ice, right? To, be, you know, to protect themselves from hunting from polar bears. And as the sea ice is melting, all the walrus has no choice but going to the beaches. Again, what if we find in ancient beaches evidence of massive haul out by walrus and seals hundreds, thousands of years ago, just like we're seeing today. Maybe that'll mean that sea ice wasn't as extensive during those times. So again, massive ramifications to such studies as past sea ice extent, okay?
And again, what we're looking is a rebound, just like sea turtles, like bison, like beaver. Just in the past few decades, there's a huge rebound, four to six times increase in, in these uh, seals and sea lions. In fact, biologists are now concerned for some endangered mosses and endemic island plants because these seals are completely destroying that. So now they're trying to uh, cut down on the sea lion and seal populations. But again, our view is when they're at their minimum or near extinct. Now we're looking at them way up here as they're rebounding. But in the past, if you go into the past, so beyond this bottleneck, the numbers would have been maybe 10 times greater than this, right? So this graph, well, let's look at the bottom graph. If you continue into the past, it'll go like this, and then it'll be way up here somewhere, many, many times the present. Just like looking at radiocarbon, right? Or uh, CO2, looking at CO2, we all know the CO2 curve over the past few decades, and then you go back through time and look at Cretaceous, and it's five, 10 times greater than today. I mean, is it relevant to today? That's a different story, but if you take a longer term view, this increase is completely masked by, by what it used to be, right? So again, our view is of this. Now we're learning that it's coming up and up and up, but this is but a fraction of what it used to be in historic times. And how do you look at historic times or in geological times? Using geological methods. In fact, I would argue even looking at recent historic evidence of activity, you still need to use archeological and geological methods. Okay, so if you put it all together, if you put the pinnipeds, seal, sea lions, right, walrus, which are mostly at high latitudes, north and south, and penguins, right, then you add sea turtles, which are low latitudes. If you add the yellow and the red, then in a lot, you know, almost most places around the world, except maybe parts of New Jersey, right, we can have either sea turtle or ancient sea turtle nest and trampling and biturbation by pinnipeds. Again, especially before human activity, and manatees in Florida and the Caribbean, right? And stellar sea cow before it was hunted to extinction in the Bering Sea. And I mean, some people even think maybe plesiosaurs, right? The Loch Ness monsters, uh, sp speaking sort of half jokingly, right? So plesiosaurs, it just most people know them as Loch Ness monsters, right? But uh, they may have, uh, also nested on beaches like sea turtles. There may be a nest from plesiosaurs, but the challenge of finding them, they're so large, you'll miss it. In the outcrop, if you see a cross section or even a bird's eye view of a plesiosaur nest, I don't know if you can recognize it because it'll be a really, really large feature. So this is the paradox. We're much better at, at identifying small burrows than very, very large features. Like, again, like large, uh, sea turtle nests, again, Cretaceous sea turtles, their, their nests were probably five, six, seven meters in diameter. And then, again, if plesiosaurs didn't bear young, live young, but nested on the beach, no evidence. But if they did, they'll be very large nests. And just something fun to think about. All right. So this hopefully, hopefully uh, give you some appreciation of the impact uh, maybe some you haven't thought about, but maybe you can be on the lookout. Uh, beaver, groundhog, burrows, fish, some of the impact, uh, especially of invasive species in local environments. And next time you're on the tropical beach, take a look at these crab burrows and uh, iguana burrows. They're quite plentiful. So with that, I'll adjourn. I'll take your questions either uh, you know, through uh, right here, speak up, or... Uh, Type them in the chat, please. Thank you for your attention. Good. We had a question on what activity creates the gouge? And I guess that's from Chris and though you mean from the from the fish? You can no, unmute yourself. No, that was referring to um these uh the beaked whales in the eastern mediterranean you uh, show yeah they're feeding the hunting with squid there are actually a couple of papers from the 90s they're hunting for squid near the bottom and squid gets real close to the bottom 
and they, as they hunt for squid, they partially scour the bottom. Also, they, some of them actually eat the benthos. They eat the, ben, the you know, little critters. and Because remember, it's very, very impoverished part of the world ocean. So they'll just try to get anything they can. So we've seen some, off Israel, we've seen some skates feeding on the bottom and actually hiding into the bottom as we approach. And then closer to Cyprus and Greece, near these volcanoes, there's a little more activity. So it's either uh, banthos, so uh, in fauna within the sediments, or they actually have pictures of squid getting real close to the bottom. A whale just comes down and lower jaw gouges the, gouges the bottom. And they've noticed them in Jurassic limestones in Germany. They've noticed these giant gouges. And we may have found some in uh, New Jersey, in Versailles, these pits that are now owned by uh, Rowan University. It's yeah. one of the largest death assemblies, right? Of the yeah. Beaches. Uh, and there's some interesting gouges right at the extinction interval. They may be either death marks or actually feeding gouges from the animals or tsunami um, uh, dr dragging body parts and wood along the bottom during Cretaceous extinction. But there are these enormous gouges, very similar to the ones I showed you with whales. You see them in New Jersey, in the green sand pits, when sea level was 30 meters higher, you see exactly the same thing. And everything else is biturbated by shrimp. 66 million year old feeding frenzy by shrimp because there are all these dead carcasses of sea turtles and whales and dinosaurs flushed out of the ancient Delaware. And they just had an absolute smorgasbord and the shrimp just went crazy. And actually at the top of the big shrimp burrows, you can take it in New Jersey as this Cretaceous tertiary boundary, right? So again, we're using burrows to our advantage rather than a disadvantage, in, you know, vandalizing our sediments. We're using all these burrows to our, to our advantage. And all of that stuff in Rowan, that's all interladen with the iridium that is known, that the KT boundary is known well, for. Well, iridium is very dispersed. Like land sections you can find it lately, but underwater, remember that, that part, in the right. green, green, in the Glasgow, in New Jersey, where the sand pits are, they're building a large exhibit center museum. The Rowan is building it. It's going to be beautiful. And you can go there and excavate and see things, these predatory sea turtles and so on on exhibit. But uh, we try to look for iridium and shirt quartz, very dispersed because it was underwater. So it's very difficult to preserve that iridium anomaly. You have to look at lake or terrestrial sections that are above water level, like the famous one in Italy. And in fact, when they're looking for shock quartz from the impact, whatever they can find is inside burrows. Yeah, so you really got to think of, of what burrows do to the sediment. Sometimes they bring up these Cretaceous ammonites into younger layers. So all of a sudden you see these ammonites in tertiary sediments where they're not supposed right? they're supposed to be all extinct together with dinosaurs and these small ammonites were brought upward above the boundary by large lobsters and shrimp, which again were just feeding on the dead critters and burrowing into the seafloor, basically Cretaceous seafloor, right? And so, so I've heard that sorry. that uh, there the, those those anomalies that you're talking about and the um, the uh, the silica the, the 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 superheated silica that came from the from the impact uh -huh. that that this evidence has been found beyond the KT layer is all of such all that evidence attributed or can be attributable to animal disposition of it. Oh uh, yeah, a lot of it can right. And remember, there's evidence that maybe final extinction was due to maybe mega eruptions and it postdated the impact. So. Uh, but def definitely looking for shock quartz and looking for uh, burrows is, is the way to go. So let me show you really quickly from another uh, talk, if you're interested in it. So again, it's sort of similar to what we've been talking about today, but now it's a seafloor story. So again, we're in New Jersey, and you see down here, you see this burrow? That's where they found shock quartz. So even when you're looking for evidence of the impact, Volcanic eruption, ash, everything like that, especially on the seafloor iridium, you have to look inside the burrows. Because what's happening, look, this is what it looks like. So if you go to central New Jersey, 
and you look at this green sand, it's completely bioturbated. All of these are burrows. In fact, here, there's nothing but burrows, like 100% bioturbated. Okay, so, and today it's happening in other parts of the world. So everything we talked about today is happening or had been happening throughout Earth history. And in this case, this is a seafloor. But again, we're using it to our advantage so we can look at these very large burrows and we can see that the tops of these very large burrows represent the extinction. Again, without going too much into detail, so you can go to New Jersey, Alabama, Texas, and all these different places, and you go above the top of the bur and all the burrows get smaller right above KT boundary because the shrimp ran out of, ran out of food. So they're just feeding, and you go to Spain, you see a similar thing, right? So that's what's happening. So again, what we talked about today is animal impact on the seafloor. So here are the turtles, here are the maybe gouges feeding by the crocodiles and plesiosaurs. And then extinction happens, right? And the shrimp are eating the, the flesh of the dead animals and burrowing into the seafloor, which is still well, from Cretaceous. It's already tertiary time, but they're burrowing into the seafloor that was Cretaceous. So the tops of these very large burrows right here, that's probably the best indicator, regional indicator of the KT boundary. Because the burrows do not move, right? Bones move, shells move, everything moves up, moves down, but the burrows themselves don't move. So again, we use, in this case, we use burrows to our advantage. Since it's all bioturbated, why not use it to come up with a good indicator of a very, very important extinction boundary. So why don't the burrows move? No, no, I mean the burrows themselves, wherever they're produced, the, the burrows themselves are in situ, right? Unless, unless they're aligned and, the, and uh, turn into a rock broken up and moved. What I mean is when you look at sediments and you look at burrows, you know the burrows are you know, where you find them, that's where they're produced. That's what I mean, they don't move. Like shells can be moved by waves, right? Bones can be moved by water. But if you find a burrow in sand, that's what the burrow formed. The burrow was not displaced from another environment. That's so right. that's so one big advantage is that all burrows more or less are in situ, right? Because it was not on the surface at the time that it was uh, kind of laid down. Well, well, the burrow can be used to figure out which way it was up. But what I mean is, when you find the burrow today and the top of the burrow, that was the top of the sediment, right? Hmm. And when you find other parts of the burrow, uh, that's where uh, it was formed. It did not come, that burrow did not, was not uh, reworked or did not come from a different environment. That's what I mean. So let me see if I can share uh, this screen right here. Right? So what I mean is this, uh, these fish bones and everything else can be moved during bioturbation. Or maybe when it was on the seafloor, see this fish? That can be moved up onto the beach or into deeper water. So when I find a shark tooth, not only it came from the water column, but it can be moved by waves on the beach or a shell. I don't know where the shell came from. There's surf clam shells in the dunes after Superstorm Sandy. There's surf clam shells in the dunes in Island Beach State Park. Obviously, surf clams don't live in the dunes. They weren't all dropped by seagulls, so they came by the storms or tsunami from the beach. So fossils, especially small ones, can move great distances. But right. a burrow These... does not move. If I find right. a burrow in this place, that's what the burrow was for. That's what I mean. The objects can be taken out of context, but you can't move the context. Exactly, yeah. Okay, except few few examples, like there's some shrimp burrow where they line them and they get lithified. So there are some shrimp burrows that can be broken off and moved, but then you know it's moved, right? Like if I give you a shark tooth, there's no way you're gonna know whether it's moved or not, unless it's really broken. But sometimes you just don't know. But if I give you a piece of a broken off burrow, you immediately say that's been moved, right? Because you know, you have an upside down burrow, just a segment of it. So you avoid it. You say, I'm not gonna use it. I'm only gonna use burrows that are in place. And if the layers are tilted, then you can always figure out the way up, right? Because burrowing goes downward. 
animals burrow downward, maybe at an angle, but they can burrow upward, right, in, into air. So you, you can also use burrows as indicators of the way up. Or I suppose, you know, swallows or other animals can burrow into the bank, into a vertical bank, something like that. But again, you see a burrow of a bank swallow, you know, which way is out, you know, the, the, you know, the burrow didn't move, right? So, you know, that that area was way above water level because swallows don't build burrows below water level. Also, you know, if there is catfish burrow under the bank swallow burrow, then, you know, long-term water table is between the two because swallows can only burrow above and catfish can only burrow below. So these, these are the ideas. So there's uh, sea turtle nests are not just indicators of ancient shorelines because sea turtles obviously um, stay right next to the beach, but also they're great indicators of sea level, right? So, so again, if, if I find an ancient sea turtle nest, then, uh, then not only I know where the, shore, the, the shoreline was nearby and which way is up, like this, okay? So if I found this ancient nest, way up on the cliff or maybe underwater, based on my modern understanding, I know that the high tide was somewhere down here, right? Because again, the bottom of the sea turtle egg chamber is still just above water level. Sea turtle is not gonna deposit eggs below high tide or in the water. So I know high tide is right about here. I also know shoreline is within 10, 20, not too far. Sea turtle is not gonna crawl beyond the frontal dune. Right? You don't have sea turtles crawling over the dune into the forest and lay no. The farthest land where they can get, if there are a lot of them, is up a little bit onto the fore dune. That's it. So you may not know the width of the beach, but you definitely know the ocean is nearby. So you have a vertical and sort of horizontal indicator now as a sea turtle nest. Again, the challenge is, is recognizing ancient sea turtle nests. And I would argue you, it's um, not challenging. Go ahead. How did you come across the uh, imaging technology? Well, was I've been it... using yeah, radar for the last 25 years in my dissertation, geological research. I've used it, especially in areas where there are a lot of gravel, you can't really dig. Or if this is protected area, you can dig. Or in the Bahamas, where sediments within 50 years turn into limestone. I mean, you're not gonna, you can't dig unless you have a saw and you start chiseling through this landscape, which again is impractical. I work in a lot of national parks and UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So either it's prohibited by sediment uh, turning into rock or not exposed, or it's a protected site or you don't have enough time, or it's gravel. There are many cases where there's no choice. And then again, it's as fast as you walk or drive behind a golf cart at the speed of light, you get this imaging, which is originally designed to look for like leaking gas tanks and now they're using it to look at cracks in the road right sometimes you see this radar being dragged behind at 40 miles an hour behind cars they're looking for cracks under uh, roads um in the war operations they put it in front of the humvees to look for uh, landmines because this will detect non-metallic landmines right so if you have plastic landmines under the beach you cannot detect them by design using metal detectors but the radar will show you the anomaly. Okay, so again, I mean, do you know the difference between what a landmine looks like versus a crab burrow? I think it's kind of important to know the difference, right? So, and so I don't start excavating, getting all excited that I'm looking at a large crab burrow, a sea turtle nest, and instead, this is an anomaly based on a plastic landmine. Kind of important to know. So, uh, so a really fantastic technology, if you know the limitations, right? Doesn't work in salt water, but above high tide works great. Uh, sandy environments really works great. Some people said it'll never work on the beach because salt water is nearby, but we all know it rains. And we all know fresh water sits on top of salt water. So there's enough of a fresh water lens. Even when we go to the upper beach, we can still see a meter or two, which is great. I mean, obviously you get close to the ocean, the signal disappears. See, it gets a little, a little attenuated, but here in the upper beach in Florida, it gets covered at high tide, but still, it's quite a good record. And again, this is all ground truth, dug up so we know exactly where the chamber is and so on. This is the body pit, but it was kind of neat to be able to spend 10 minutes 
find this anomaly and have volunteers dig down and find the eggs deposited on the previous night. And then multiply it by thousands, in some cases today, and multiply it by millions. Because sea turtle nests do not disappear. They may be eroded, but they do not vanish, right? In ancient beach sequences, they're still there. They're just filled or covered. Maybe some of them have parking lots and buildings on top, but they're all still there. So finding them, again, is important to tell us where the ancient nesting sites are, how numerous they were, make sure we don't confuse them with archeological uh, pits or graves or uh, storm and tsunami depressions. And also they're really great indicators of ancient shorelines in a horizontal sense and ancient sea level in a vertical sense. And then just a single sea turtle egg chamber can give us that much sort of purely environmental, geological, ecological information. Okay, so this is a really great record. This is fantastic. In fact, it even shows you how this beach was getting wider and then a storm came and cut all these layers. You can see all these layers completely disappear. And that was a storm a few hundred years ago. And right after the storm, all the sand came back and built this ridge. And there are more than 30 of these ridges just in one place in the Bahamas. So what I'm showing you is beach, a younger ridge, and another beach. But there are 30 of these ridges. So as you go back away from the ocean, you go to a more and more ancient beach, which is great, right? You don't always need to dig downward to get to more ancient layers. Right, because these are not horizontal, these are slanted, like beaches are slanted, they're at an angle. So rather than going downward, we simply walk backwards, in this case to your left, and we get into more and more and more ancient beaches. And maybe at some point, all of a sudden, boom, we'll start finding many, many sea turtle nests, and they'll tell us that this beach was a sea turtle nest in ground in the past. And using dating, right, we can figure out when sea turtles were nesting there, probably pre-Columbus, right? Because they're hunting to extinction uh, within the last few hundred years. So if there's no other questions, I don't, I don't want to hog the stage here. So if there's anybody else who has any no, other I questions. I still have time, please, please uh, ask away. So I have a question about death pits. Um, I think that example that you brought up in Rowan is a really good one, but the, you know, as the story goes, and as you said, the, the, the mass extinction, I mean, the, the Rowan site is an example of what could be the very last moments of the Cretaceous. Um, exactly. Yes. And, and I was, so when I was, when I lived in Thailand as a volunteer, there was a death pit that we excavated. That's what that I'm talking was, about, right? So that these gouges, anyway, go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Right, so this death pit was a very loose uh, mudstone, a mm -hmm. sandstone, and, um, and it was full of turtle shells and, uh -huh. um, turtle shells and giant crocodilian teeth. Uh -huh. And then uh, the lar the really massive bones of Camarasaurus, which is uh, yep. a relatively small. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the of the genus anymore, but the the larger herbivores. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and uh, and the the what was really impressive to me is that the um, the turtle shells are these are thick pieces. I mean they're three, four centimeters thick, yep. and they are bashed to bits, right? They're really hammered, but they're not smoothed over. It's, they're heavily impacted, right? They're fragmented, yes, yeah. Right, right. And, and then you've got, you know, it's very rare to see an intact bone. You don't, you don't get intact skulls of anything. Um, lots of deformation in the bones because of compression, mm -hmm. but the, the big hum humeruses and, and femurs of the, of the Camarasaurus come out oh. nicely. Um, I could never, and I, frankly, I didn't trust the geologists and the paleontologists, 
why there would be such a heterogeneous assembly of really what what looks like really violent activity um all in one space is there an explanation for that because i know these are not uncommon these death pits right right and obviously we're not talking about stomach contents of some big predator that died and now you're just simply looking no this is a very large extent yeah very large extent yeah so, and again, these are just gouges right at the Katie, but these are probably right at the Katie boundary. I, I took pictures before they excavated it for fossils. It truncates these shrimp burrows, which are all over the place. And then just sort of shallow, and it's imagine just taking a, like scratching a wood desk with a, with a nail. So it's very, very gently uh, tapering in all directions, but some are several centimeters down. There are no fossils. But what you're talking about, yeah, there are probably these tephrosinosis, these death assemblages, but also you may have the preferential accumulation of them in, in these pits. Maybe there's a scour by a car and producing the pit, and once all these large fragmented pieces accumulate there, there's no way for them to be reworked. They're just sort of hide in the pit, right? If you look at the top left, once you input a lot of fragments, fossil fragments to this pit, there's no mechanism to get them out of the pit. So maybe just a natural trap rather than a death It is a, it's not really a death assemblage, it's sort of the accumulation of, of skeletal remains, it's called the taphosinosis rather than thanatosinosis. But anyway, so here you have this natural depression maybe uh, where they accumulated, but they couldn't get out of it. There's no mechanism to get them out of it. So you have this heterogeneous skeletal assemblage. But that's, that's an interesting one. If you have reference, I'd like to look at it. That's an interesting one, because that's all we see here. Here, just a gouge filled with clay. Uh, and the, that gouge might be where a, a river uh, empties out into a delta? Oh, well, or... Delaware was, was some distance away, but these are mechanical gouges for sure. So it, I see. they found some driftwood. Actually, Ken Lakawara found driftwood with a little stones still inside the root. So these were trees that were ripped off. And then it sank. We found some driftwood, but these are like rafted stone. So maybe it was a chunk of tree dragged along the bottom. Maybe it's tsunami. Another thing, they all oriented in the same direction. There are three or four of them. I took pictures of them. They're enormous. They're like a meter or more. They're quite large, as you can see. Three, four feet in length, uh, maybe uh, five, six inches in, uh, in width. They're really large, shallow at large, and uh, all on the same level, all pointing in the same direction. So they're probably not feeding, right? I mean, the animal has no reason feeding all in one direction unless it's oriented to car. And so what I mean is maybe they're, so this crocodile is dying and now it's becoming a tumor, right? It's no longer an animal, right? So it's being transported by the tsunami, a bottom car, and it's using this crocodile skull or body just as a tool, just dragging it along the bottom, just like it would drag a uh, submerged, uh, chunk of wood or anything else. But these are not little shells. These are either large bones or large submerged chunks of wood. But it's tough to submerge wood unless it's very soaked and degassed. So uh, something going on there, very large tool marks dragged along the bottom. And these are not ammonite shells. These are very large. So I don't know what they are. That's why I call them enigmatic. But it'd be nice to see, you know, to look at the ones filled with fossils, as you said, see what the difference is. There's a paper, again, looking at these feeding, but they're feeding grooves in Jurassic German limestones. So they're not drag marks. They're not tool marks. They're not death assemblies. They're just feeding grooves, like I showed with those Mediterranean whales. That was a theory that the, that the uh, paleontologists had, is that the crocodiles were doing their typical, you know, twisting and, uh -huh, and, uh -huh. and somersault right, right, moves, right, right, right. Yeah. and their, their teeth were coming out because there's such uh -huh. physicality to it. Uh -huh. And then the, 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 the carpaceae of the turtles are getting exploded. Um, oh, wow. And I mean, that, you know, it's very dramatic, right? Yeah. And <laughs> I just yeah. have a, I guess I had a hard time believing the drama. Yeah. Um, you know, these are whale gouges. Some of these are actually skates. But a lot of these are whale gout. I can show, I actually have video, deep sea video of skates. Such low sedimentation rate, these get preserved. And again, some of these whales dive to almost 2,000 meter depth. And they, especially around these volcanoes, 
and they feed on the bottom. And there's actually a picture for one of these papers by uh, I think a Woodside or I think Woodside. It shows a squid all rolled up hiding near the bottom and the whale just, you know, the whales go down and feed on the squid and I guess they skim a little bit of the bottom. I don't see if there's any other reason for them to, to grab a chunk of the bottom. Either they grab it as they try to get to the squid that tries to hide near the bottom or they actually feed like gray whales, they feed on the little benthos, little mini crusta crustaceans and worms, whatever else. Like gray whales, they obviously feed, you know, these depressions, they feed on benthos, right? Right here, they just skim mud. Walrus feeds on uh, clams, they hydrojet, right? Just blow water. So there's a great paper looking at Pleistocene, like 12,000 year old evidence of herds of walrus of Washington state because there are all these clamshell, broken clamshells, like you were saying, in these vertical shafts. And there's definitely evidence of walrus trying to get at them. This is from National Geographic, but it's a really nice way of showing how skates and sea rays also hydrojet. They jet water into the sediment to get the sediment out. And one animal can produce many, many traces, right? Like we as people leave one skeleton, but we leave millions of traces, especially in soft sediment. So we're talking about trillions and quadrillions of traces all around the world at different times, overlapping. Some burrows are filled, some are active, some, some are trampled, some animals overprint others. So again, each animal has many, many, many times more uh, volumetrically uh, geologic work than it could just by leaving behind its skeleton. So, and just something to pay attention, not just look at body parts, but look at the traces animals leave behind. I'm just much more into larger animals. Again, sometimes challenging to interpret these as traces because, you know, large, you have to have a large view or a full exposure, but definitely I think understudied and quite important, uh, especially for prehistoric times when they're much more numerous than today. All right, thank you so much. Um, it's been really kind of eye-opening uh, working with you um, just on our on our present day um, and you know near history um, analysis of beaver impacts. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, this just continue, yeah. yeah, just seeing the um, seeing all the ways in which we're missing um, or we're misinterpreting things. Um, it's always like mind blowing to think that um, an animal um, produced, you know, an animal or a collection of animals over time um, produced a level of change that just seems way, way, way too um, large to be attributed to that. Um, but it is in fact true. And it's, uh, it's, it's amazing kind of the balance that you have to strike between allowing yourself to believe um, in the mechanisms and the, the power of these historic animals versus um, allowing yourself to just ignore it completely and think that they they weren't even um, impact at all so kind of getting that balance of how much absolutely the animals absolutely versus, well, i think that, yeah. that it's too, too trivial or too isolated i can tell you right now i can show you an image of the beach with sea turtle nest and show it to a hundred geologists a geophysicists gpr experts and ask them what do you think it is there may be many different views, but I can almost guarantee almost nobody would think of a sea turtle nest. I can even tell them it's from Florida because we just don't think, we just think they're so far, what is the chance of that being a sea turtle nest, right? They'll come up with storm erosion and wind scour and ripple and anything like that, anything but biogenic activity. And I was the same way. Again, I was working primarily in Maine, so there are no sea turtles there. But still, once you get down, especially to low latitudes, I always have to have this red flag coming up. Every time I look at the buried depression or anomaly under the beach, yes, it's more likely it's physical processes, waves, tides, rivers, but I cannot discount biogenic activity. Yeah. Right? I have to consider it. And the point that you made is a lot of times it's not even considered. It's not part of the options at all. And when you say it is, you say, ah, what are the chances? And to even see like captured sea turtle nests, because we think of them as being 
few and far between. But as I showed you, even today, these arribadas, there are thousands of sea turtles coming up on the beach in Belize, and just like too isolated. So those people living on that beach, they know how numerous they are. But we're sitting here, we don't appreciate it because we only see one sea turtle climbing up the beach in Maryland and that's it. Yeah. So that's and we even that's see kind of like beautiful. how um, how much of an effect these different animals can have um, without you know the assistance of um, earth moving technology, simply with the you know the impact of their bodies um, and the the number of their population really kind of um, puts into perspective how much more um, human animal can impact um, our landscape. Um, you know, with the assistance of um, kind of extensions of our body. So it's a, it's a pretty cool perspective to have. Yeah, and definitely, you know, longer term perspective, the entire landscapes were changed. You know, when the animals went from grazing, to, uh, from browsing to grazing, and the animals started having a set of five little hooves, right? The horses, then three hooves, then a single really hard hoof. They, the impact on ancient landscape was enormous. Again, a little tiny horse, size of a cat, walking on five little hooves or three little somewhat hard hooflets versus a big horse running around with a giant hard hoof churning up the sediment or just compacting the sediment. That's a complete, complete change to a landscape. So you go from browsing to grazing, you affect the vegetation over entire continents, and then you go from little hooves to big hooves. And by the way, nobody has described the footprints of the largest land animal that ever lived. That Oligocene rhino from like 30 million years ago, they're there, you just have to go to like Pakistan right now, but nobody's found the footprints, we found skeletons. The largest land animal that ever lived, nobody described a single footprint yet. So, so they definitely affected the landscape, compacted and maybe caused some river course change, that sort of thing. There was um, a series on Nova that I think might still be on right now about uh, the natural history of Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I usually think of natural history beginning around the Devonian and the Silurian. Mm -hmm. um, and, you uh -huh. know, that, that first or second mass extinction. Yes. And I rarely ever think about geologic time beyond that. But the record in in Australia is so much deeper, yeah. and uh, oh, yeah. this this geologist is talking about uh, a. Um, I'm going to get this wrong, but but in a nutshell, the geologist is talking about a symbiosis of bacteria and something else that was creating tons and tons of oxygen yeah. right at the top of the of the of the sea surface uh, the and, algae, yeah, yeah. and it created um essentially free free oxygen mm -hmm. in the sea that then just oxidized iron yes. for the next several hundred million years yeah banded and iron formations yeah that's yeah. that's exactly right and then as but but these animals keep going or these plants rather keep oh, going yes. and create oxygen rich the oxygen rich atmosphere yeah. of planet earth i mean talk about a biogenic effect right Absolutely. yeah we, that's we are new effect yeah or that's a whole different effect i'm just talking about earth's surface but yeah i mean atmosphere absolutely right i i just i i found that to be revelatory yeah. um uh, it's a unique planet 